Welcome to Bible Over Brews, deep thoughts from an overtime text. This is our inaugural episode of Bible Over Brews Reviews. I'm coming at you, Aaron Crew Juice the Verka, and we are covering none other than Gumby Lopez. Hola. We've got Sam. Hi. Sam, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, uh, Sam from Brooklyn, Ohio. Been there for about, I don't know, 12 years now. Holy crap. It's, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, uh, graduated from Bowling Green in 2019. And I've just been uh, job hopping ever since. But I think I found something I like. So I'm working towards uh, a better future. Sam Sam is a good friend. we got some history in the same church together. We've had like an annual, I don't know, tradition going on at my house. Game nights. Tacos. Taco game nights. And just a good friend. For a while you were uh, going to be a pilot, right? So I got my pilot's license uh, my first year in college, and it was a bit too expensive for me and a couple other things that just made a career change during college, but I do have my pilot's license. It never expires, but I am not current. Yeah, yeah. But if there's a zombie apocalypse or you need to get out, I'm your guy. You're the man. Yeah, I mean, who's like, who cares, man? You got your pilot's license. That's more than I can say. <laughs> it's, it's, Flying a plane is uh, safer than driving a car, actually. Yeah. Uh, statistically. It's kind of like the government's license to kill. It just never expires. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> as long as you're in a three-letter alphabet. Yeah, we are starting off our night with platform strawberry cheesecake. Mm. This rich and creamy porter uses bones strawberry cheesecake coffee to impart notes of ripe strawberry Cheesecake, freshly roasted coffee, and graham cracker crust. It's a 5.8 ABV and a 31 IBU. All right. And as you Ooh, know, you have to a, pour it down until you're hitting. It's a little darker than I expected for a. 45% for a cheesecake. <laughs> then pour down the center. I think this is a chocolate cheesecake. I know. <laughs> Because yeah, it's a little heady too. It Bones is. coffee. All right. Yeah. For a, uh, I gotta tell you, for a porter, that is definitely a little on the heady side. Mm-hmm. Now the, uh, ooh, and it's got a good smell. That I like the aroma. Nose. So nice. That's very sweet. Oh man, there's strawberry. I was gonna say. Mm. I, I feel I smell the smoothness. That is like, definitely so strawberry. It reminds <laughs> me of pink stuff in milk. Yeah. Yeah. You guys remember that? That little powder yeah. stuff you put in your milk? Yes. I don't even know if they make that anymore. <laughs> it, awesome. it, it reminds me of high school days. That little strawberry uh, milk that we got. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, man. Or Pepto. <laughs> that is such a nice <laughs> flavor. I mean, it's a porter, but it doesn't it doesn't taste like a porter. You know, it, it has that uh, strawberry wow. cheesecake flavor right on top of it. And I can taste a little bit of that graham crust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. That's really nice. Well, we got platform on again. That is, there's nothing harsh to that at all. And if you re- recall our first podcast, Aaron, back in 2016, yep, it was platform. It was platform. So they are a reoccurring guest. <laughs> Good job, Platform. Good job. We're going to let you stay in business in the Cleveland area for a little bit longer. (laughs) A little bit. I will say, and the person that doesn't really drink beer, Mm -hmm. especially anything other than Blondale, Hmm. this is is good. I am definitely not a beer aficionado or or whatever it's called, but... Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. But you could drink this. I I could easily drink this. I think, you know, I, I think my wife would drink this, and she doesn't drink beer at all. No. It is, it's just, it's de- deceptive because yeah. you see the darkness and you expect it to kind of hit you in the face a little bit, mm-hmm. right? Like a porter would, a mm-hmm. nice, deep, dark porter. But man, I, I have to say this, this is silky smooth, like dangerously silky yeah, that's, smooth. Yeah, that's a key there. It could, we could be walking on nerf in a little bit. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> with, with the darkness, you, I, I, I envision like something like thick, something that yeah. just a bold. Right. This is, it. it it feels thin mm-hmm. yet creamy due to the cheesecake. Yep. This is quite pleasant. Like amazingly pleasant. I feel like we've had a nice meal and it is now time for dessert. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to take a sip out of the can. See, yeah. I, I feel like there's always a difference a little bit from the glass oh, yeah. out of the can. And there is something to that. Mm-hmm. So so Gumby is not incorrect because when you go to pour it, the, one of the reasons that you that you pour a beer is to get rid of some of the CO2 that's mm-hmm. sitting inside of it from its uh, carbonation and from its process. And you definitely get more carbonation. Yes. Yeah, I like and, it better in a glass. Uh, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that when you, if you don't pour it, a lot of people will say, well, I feel a little bit bloated afterwards. Mm-hmm. And the reason why you get that bloating is because that CO2 that sits inside of it in the can. And what happens is you take all of that in. Well, when you pour it, if you pour about halfway down and you pour the rest down the center, right in the center of the glass, mm-hmm. then it releases a lot of that and you end up giving more flavor and you uh, have less of that digestive problem. Mm. So. I don't know about yeah. beers, but You're like Wikipedia, like, man. <laughs> whenever I have wine, I let it breathe. I already have my wine opened up, but maybe with with beer, it's the same kind of concept of just letting it breathe for a time. They let that CO two escape. Yeah, but I do wonder what what's what's best: can, glass, or bottle. Well, there are some beers we've had in the past where I like the way it tastes better in the can. I feel like it was meant to be that way. Like leave it in the can; it tastes better versus when all the the elements kind of open up. It felt a little too thin for me, so there's definitely more concentration in that sense. But this this one really nails it almost in the glass. Like a Corona. A Corona yeah, is almost always better in the bottle. Yeah, oh for sure. <laughs> Barely good anyway. But <laughs> oops, I meant. I didn't mean that. But maybe for our next podcast, Sam, with you on, we're gonna do a wine one. Ooh, that would be nice. Because we have yet to do just a wine episode. Yeah, we we've touched on wines, but we haven't spent a lot of time in them. Yeah. So I, now that I'm thinking back, I feel like we have actually. We, we did one episode with wines. Okay. And I keep hinting that we're going to do more, and we really do need to explore because we have some amazing wineries in across Ohio. We do. Mm-hmm. We, we really really do. do. Go out to like Geneva, Ohio. You have M Winery and Ferranti, and there's just mm. a, a lot of really nice wineries out there. Which would pair well with these fine cigars we're smoking tonight. Oh, yeah. Perdomo's. So this is my first time smoking a cigar. Not quite sure how to do it, but uh, they're walking me through it, so. You're doing it, man. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is a Perdomo. It is their vintage line, double vintage, aged 12 years. Ooh. Their tasting notes. It has a smooth smoke with a creamy complexity, slight hints of caramel and cedar, with rich with a rich buttery finish and the wrapper has been aged in bourbon bourbon barrel aged oh i have to say gumby always does a phenomenal job picking these suckers out aged 12 years i mean come on mm. so do you have that lighter somewhere i think mine went out mm-hmm. there we go so and it actually uh, pairs pretty well with this beer i would say so i mean I enjoy a cigar, but I would say that Gumby is more of the connoisseur when it comes to cigars. <laughs> As you are with the bourbon. Well, thank you, sir. And beer. We haven't featured him on the show that much, but I sincerely enjoy my wines. We do. I really do. Yeah, yeah no, we got we to gotta have some good ones on. I, I love a good red wine, man. Yep. There we go. All right, I think I got the hang of it. a boy, Sam. We're really stoked about having Sam on our show. Absolutely. It's going to be a fun one. So, Gumby. Yes. Question. Shoot. How long have you been in the music industry? <clears throat> well, so in the industry or as a, you know, just music been a part of my life. Those are two separate questions, I think. In terms of working. Okay. I would say I've been a working musician probably from... Trying to think back to my earliest paid gig. Two thousand four, two thousand five. One of my first real big gigs I remember playing was at Severance Hall. Okay. And it was just a little jazz trio. And it was kind of a funny situation, but it was for a, uh, a college university graduating. I can't remember which college it was. And they needed some background music up on a stage. And it was, you know, it was a paid union gig. So, that was 
you know, all those people were subjected to us. <laughs> <laughs> they had no choice but to hear autumn leaves and, you know, all the jazz standards and whatever. And how old were you when you uh, did that? Ish? Early 20s. Okay. Yeah. About my age, a little bit less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably a lot less kids and, uh, yeah, I don't even think I had two at the time or maybe two. Okay. So, yeah, since that time, you, you know, <clears throat> on and off in a sense as a working professional doing that. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So what are your favorite instruments and yeah. how many instruments do you play? Wow. Uh, well, my I I would say that my favorite instrument is a it. It's always going to go back to the drums for me. That was my my first love was percussion. Uh, you know, my mother would always say that you know that came from as a gift from God. When I was a baby, when I would be in our Spanish church. I would you know she'd hold me on her shoulder, and I would just always be tapping away at the music that was going on in church and just hitting her shoulder so hard and I just loved it so I grew up with that influence and that culture from the Spanish church the evangelical side of things and you know from the earliest moments that they can remember and recall of me I was on pots and pans playing so it, it was always it was destined to be a part of my life that's awesome but you know in, in the early uh, maybe late teen early 20 I took a really strong liking to the piano and I also studied the piano two jazz piano so I I'm equally at home sitting down at the piano and playing so I I do that but if I only had one instrument to choose on an island it'd probably be the drums okay yeah well that's culturally that goes back as far as humans go back so you're safe there (laughs) (laughs) but you know my involvement at the church uh, and you're right about that I mean Especially in terms of communication. Uh, You know, my involvement at the church necessitates me more these days to sit at the piano and and lead music from the piano and sing. I also sing, too. So, man, does he sing. I tell you what, if you go to uh, the beginning of any of our podcasts, that's all Gumby. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, well, I do enjoy doing it. I mean... you got to love what you do. And especially with music and all of that, if you, I don't ever want it to feel like work. Yeah. You know, even though I know that it is and there are, you know, hours that you got to invest and in w- whatever involvement that may include, I it's always a joy. I, I really feel like it's just because it was God's gift to me. Um, it's, it's just never going to leave. Even if I do other work on the side, because I do, you know, because... You know, especially after COVID, I mean, music playing live took a big hit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to find, uh, you know, other means to kind of help supplement, you know. <clears throat> but as a musician, especially with a jazz background, you were always kind of used to that anyway. You always had to have multiple streams. You know, I there is there is that industry where you can't just be working all the time doing that. But so like it's hard. Britney Spears then. <laughs> yeah, more like Lady Gaga, you know. <laughs> Who? I mean, she's she's jazz trained, man. Yeah. Have you ever heard her sing with Tony Bennett? That was a really good duet. Oh my god, can she sing yeah. jazz? That was actually a really good duet. And how is he singing like like at a hundred years old? Oh man? my lord, he hasn't really lost a beat. But you know what? That's that goes back to what I'm saying. Like when you're truly walking in your gift that you were created to do. It doesn't feel like work. Yeah. So. But you're no John Coltrane or anything like that. No. <laughs> nope. Not at all. <laughs> no culture. I mean, that man is. I I'm standing on the shoulders of so many. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Coltrane was. <laughs> you know, no pun intended, but giant steps. So that was you know what he's famous for. So huge, huge uh, icon and pioneer and. That's awesome. So, yeah. Who are your inspirations going into the music industry? Do you have specific uh, musicians that you emulated after yeah. your, yourself or, mm-hmm. or different musical artists? Or 
Yeah. So if we're talking about just drums, I mean, that's, it's, that's a big question. I mean, cause I, there's so many that I look up to in the modern sense. One of the drummers I've always looked up to, uh, was, was a drummer named Vinnie Calyuta. Um, He's played with so many of my favorite artists. He's played with everybody from Sting to Chick Corea, who recently passed, R.I.P. brother. Um, he's played with everybody from like Megadeth mm. to, um, he did a duet with Ed Sheeran. I can't think of his name oh, right now. Oh, Andrea Bocelli. Yes, I mean, yeah. so Vinny's played with so many diverse different people. So early on in my career, I thought, man, if I could be like that guy and just play with, have the ability to sit down with anyone and different artists that or in the studio. I love doing studio stuff too. That's what I kind of like to be like. And I was able, because of my wife, able to meet Vinny Cauito one time oh, and wow. I got some pictures with him and he's also a believer. So that's just, that take your really breath cool. away. Yeah. Incredible. But some other artists I like, you know, in terms of singing, I don't just like jazz. I mean, I love, Big fan of the 80s and the 70s. I love Ambrosia. I love Steve Winwood, Bruce Hornsby, Tears for Fears. You know, I like all kind of different variety of music. All the stuff I grew up on. Yeah, love. <laughs> I love gospel music. Uh, so you got to have a lot of different influences to, to be able to make yourself versatile. with. And that's one of the things I feel like, uh, you know, definitely not to toot my own horn, but I feel like I am versatile enough to sit down with a lot of variety of people, That's not awesome. just jazz. So okay. So outside of outside of jazz, what other um, musical influences do you have, or do you f- flow through rock or blues, or what's where do you feel at home outside of outside of jazz? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, I do love praise and worship music. That's always near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, people like from Elevation Music, Map Rock. I love the way they write, they sing. Um, I, I'm a big fan of songwriters. So I love like John Legend. Okay, yeah. Uh, I love the way he writes. I love the way they storytell. Like James Taylor, such a story. Those guys are storytellers, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. They just kind of transcend the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they just have an ability to tell a story. Yeah. So I love that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, I love um, your Stephen Taylor's, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael um, W. Smith. Yeah, I love Michael W. Smith. Yeah, he's great. He, he's, he's one of my favorites. He's actually a great composer too. Mm-hmm. Huh? Very great mm-hmm. uh, orchestral composer and uh, arranger. Mm-hmm. Huh? I don't think he gets enough credit for that for sure because he's always, you know, known for his voice and his singing and his yeah, uh, kind of quote unquote pop hits in the Christian. Uh, field, but he's such a great composer. Huh. Uh, That's awesome. Don Henley. Love Don Henley. Love Phil Collins. Don Henley and Phil Collins, not only are they great singers and leaders of their bands, but they were also drummers. No. So I think there's a connection there between singers and band leaders who are also drummers who just have a unique approach. And both those guys have different vo- types of voices, which I really love. That almost makes me think of like a Phil Collins. Yeah. Yeah. Who's yeah. A, 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 not only a vocalist, but a drummer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a big fan of different types of voices. So, uh, you know, I, I Chicago, Peter Cetera, I, I grew up on Chicago. I used to just put headphones on sometimes, listening to Chicago and knowing all their songs and singing their songs. And so... Journey. Who doesn't love Journey? Oh my lord! And one of the number one uh, albums of all time, right? Yeah, they are a journey. <laughs> I mean, and that man's voice is just, you know, again, but it's such a different voice. Yeah, you know, there, there just can't be another one like that, and I, I appreciate that. So, so yeah. So okay. What do you, what do you think is like the most important when it comes to like music? Is it, is it the tone? Is it the sound? The message? Is it something else? Like with any music or with my music or just music in general? Go with it. Sure. Yes. I think the most important thing, you know, and I think this is kind of being, um, it's a good question, being rediscovered, especially after the last two years, we're coming to realize like 
it's awesome that we have this ability to do music through Zoom. We had to make do with what we had, right? We were all, you know, we we just had to make do with what we did, right? Couldn't do that before. And while Zoom did work and we, we found a way to make it work because I think that's what we do as humans. We just, we find a way to adapt. But I think we're coming out of that thinking, man, that connection, that spirituality that's that's mm-hmm. within music was kind of hard to get just through Zoom. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think the most important thing about music is that we have the ability to speak and connect to each other. You know, I... I could listen to almost any type of music if it's reaching me on a deeper level. So, so message it sounds like is uh, out of those three would be your most important. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean vocals. Mm-hmm. It could not be vocals, mm-hmm. but it has to hit me on that deeper level. And if it does, man, I'll listen to bluegrass or yeah. you know whatever. It well, there's some good bluegrass out there. There is absolutely, <laughs> um, but for me, it's about that soul, man, and it. it it's got to connect on that deeper level. And I feel like, man, especially after the last two years, there's going to be such a reemergence of that we're going to find. And I think even though it may be hard to see right now, but I think that it's, it's, it's just going to rebirth. Well, just like with not that we're comparing COVID to the bubonic plague, but after the Black Death, there was a huge golden age. Excellent point, Sam. Very true. And and, and and that's true throughout any time in history where mm-hmm. we've had a very dark period. The cultural arts always flourished after that. It's always a renaissance. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and I think that's, you know, for me, I, I look at that as God just saying, hey. With, with death comes life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And life more abundantly. So Amen. I feel like music is a, a big part of that. And people are, you know, people want to get out and play. People don't want to just stay locked up and, you know, fearful and, and scared. I don't think that should be a part of the equation for that. So so let, let's flip that one around because mm-hmm. we discussed the things you enjoy the most. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is your least favorite instrument to play that you can <laughs> play and why? <laughs> My least favorite thing? To sorry, play. For, sorry for those who play it. <laughs> yeah, well, I would have to say my least favorite thing to play would be only from a uh, a technical standpoint because of my inability to play it the way that I want to play it, and that would probably be the bass. Okay, I love the bass. I wish I could play the acoustic bass. Yeah, uh, but I have you know a couple electric basses at home that for a while I was pushing myself to really be all right. I I can do this. Like I really want to do that. But, so that would probably be my least favorite to play. You know, I could get the job done, but I, you know, I'm no bass player. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I love the instruments and I have so many favorite bass players, you know, that I'm just in awe of that, you know, amazing. So Jacko Pastorius, Christian McBride, uh, you know, just, just so many. Okay. Yeah. Leland Sklar. That is a bass player that most people probably never even heard the name of, but look him up. Leland Sklar, S-K-L-A-R. You, if you go on YouTube and you look him up, he's like he looks like Moses. Like he just came <laughs> down from the mountain. Seriously, man. Yeah. He's got this amazing beard, all white hair. This man has played since the 70s oh, wow. with everybody. I mean, he's played with, you name it, He's he's done it, and it's probably him on the record. Just an amazing player and, and and such a great person, and you know he's inspiring to me because he still does it. And you know it, you kind of got to reinvent yourself. So like especially after COVID and all of that, you see a lot of musicians going to YouTube and just saying, "Hey, you know what? All right, we can't do this, but I can offer this now. Yeah, like I can teach, I can give my gift away. You know, I can tell you stories that most people would never know." But he's given you these stories. And so I'm seeing this from a lot of the artists that I really look up to. So I appreciate that. But okay. yeah, that would have to be the bass here. And, I, <laughs> and that's because I want to be a better bass player. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. That's excellent. Good points. So when you, when you go to play, mm-hmm. when you go to play, well, really anything, mm-hmm. 
What is the inspiration that drives you mm. to want to play? Is there an impetus behind it? Uh, something in your soul or your mind yeah. or your what, what inspires you to get in front of an instrument and play? What what is in your head? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Uh, sometimes it can be different things. Um, you know, and I and I would say that that's separate from me than wanting to hit because I still just like to practice my drums and, and brush up on my reading, having to read music or whatever. That's a different thing for me. I, I'm I'm motivated, intrinsically motivated, to do those kind of things just to keep keep my craft up. But when it comes to the creating part, like what you're talking about, where maybe it's a job or I have to create for someone, a client. Uh, I'm also intrinsically motivated to do that. Okay. However, there's a third side to that two-sided coin. <laughs> However, that works. It's common core math. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to create and what keeps me wanting to create, I think really goes back to uh, what we all want to do Re- really as humans and especially as believers in Christ and we believe in God inherently you know if we believe the creator was a creator yeah. at the very beginning right yeah and you know we're his magnum opus right his you know his jewel his creation so i think that inherently makes all human beings on some level wanting to create something want to emulate him yeah it's it exactly it's a good answer yeah we we all have this thing inside of us Uh, that needs to create something and I think that something you know is ultimately given restoring a relationship to him or giving glory to him however we want to look at it it's in it's inside of all of us and so for me I I channel that through music and I I want to create I want to create new things and uh, and play something I never played before I'd say that's even true for for non-believers they they have this Every human has that innate need, yeah. that innate desire, mm-hmm. just searching. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Yeah. And that... I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, because most people, or a lot of people, I don't want to say most, I, I don't want to use broad uh, sweeps here, but a lot of people may not realize why, what compels them to want to keep creating. I, I, I think that's just part of our humanity. You know, you know, we're looking for purpose. We're trying to create that purpose. And, you know, I, I saw a quote one time that said the secret to the meaning of life is to give life meaning. We have to we have to create if we're not creating as human beings, whatever it is that you feel compelled to do. There's a part of you that's going to fill that gap. God created feel th- the sandbox and we're just in it. To play, yeah. To find well, that, whatever we want whatever you want meaning to be exactly yeah you'll feel a void within inside of you and once once you find out what it is and that passion and that thing that sparks sparks you to to get up out of bed and or whatever it is you know you have to create so okay that's that's what motivates me intrinsically to want to create new things and new music and and all of that and sometimes just you know play with my son who plays piano he can play jazz he doesn't he he likes to write pop but you know sometimes we'll just sit down and play and uh, and we could just create you know not only that but isn't he going to college soon for that or yeah yeah he's actually gonna uh, start LA recording school of music Mm -hmm. he writes all his own music very nice and um, you know he's great singer uh, really good pianist um, and a great arranger, and he's just good at a lot of the technical stuff around uh, recording and engineering and mixing and all of that. So, so your kids are picking up where where you're leaving off. Yeah. How how yeah. does that make you feel to be you and your wife? Because your your wife yeah. is an amazing singer. She is amazing vocalist. Yeah. To be that inspiration for your kids to be one of the greats, you know, mm-hmm. to look back on. You know, you Here's just his Beethoven. Yeah. Well. <laughs> You want them to walk in their gift. And, you know, I I remember sitting at the piano one time and I was playing a jazz standard. I think it was uh, All the Things You Are. 
Okay. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that song. Yeah, probably, absolutely. You are the da, 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 that tune. Mm-hmm. Um, I was sitting at the piano playing that, right? And it's a you know harmonically speaking, talking about the, the structure and the chords of a song harmonically, right? It's a pretty complicated song. Okay. It's not. It's not like a church song. It, it's complicated. Get back to that later on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Gio's ears picked up. And he came over and he just stood by me and he's looking over my shoulder, watching me and looking at the music. He's like, and then out of blue, he's like, dad. And he must have been like 11 at the time. He's like, dad, can you teach me that? Teach me that song? And I was just kind of staggered. And I'm like, what 11 year old really wants to do that? Is willing to want to take the time to learn, to figure out the chords, to figure out the fingering, to look at the music. And it... And I think uh, with Gio especially, like the melody hit him. So mm-hmm. there was something about the melody that just like grabbed him. And I, and I feel the same way because it was the same with me. And he did it. And he learned it. And awesome. he played it for his school recital at like 11 years old. <laughs> and people were just like. And I mean, he played it mm-hmm. fluently. <laughs> and dad glowed. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, everyone did because I was really amazed. I'm like, what the heck, man? And that's when I realized, man, I got to push him. He, I, you know, I not in a was, negative sense. But. I think it was Mozart that made his first composition at age I four, age Mozart. five. Yeah, yeah I love just Mozart. Ridiculous. Some some people just have an ear for it, and man, apparently you have good genes. <laughs> well, Gio, Gio definitely had an ear for it way earlier on than that. I remember one time composing music in a recording session upstairs. Uh, and I was struggling with this one part, and I, you know, I'm sure I was playing bad notes or whatever. <laughs> and um, you know, I'm playing the piano, and Gio's walking up and down the steps, playing with his transformers, making all these noises, and and then he pops his little head in the room as I'm recording, right? And he goes, "Dad," I'm like, "What?" He goes, "You played a bad note." And he must have been like five or six. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks. Wow. I'm like, he, but he was right. And his ears could pick up on that. Yeah. Truth from the mouth of babes. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so I should have got him tested to see if he has perfect pitch. Uh, but he's, he just has really good ears. So he can hear something on it. You know, he, a certain note will pop out and, you know. And he'll say, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the note G. Or that's A flat, or that's B, or whatever. Oh, that's and I'm phenomenal. Like, that's phenomenal. That's really cool. Yeah. I can't do that. I can associate certain notes and certain intervals, but he can just hear the note and do that. So that's that's the kind of ear he has, and that's the kind of yeah musician he is too. So I'm I'm absolutely proud of him for that. Yeah. I almost don't wonder if uh, if certain people, due to some inability, have better ability. You know, it's like some people who suffer from sight have better hearing and touch. And, you know, so sometimes I wonder, you That's know. Well, when it comes to, like, hearing that tone, I'd say I'm, I'm more of a Beethoven in his later years. Okay. You know, not, not being able to hear. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny you reference. I actually grew up on classic music, so. That is yeah. my favorite, if you can't tell. Classical, yeah. Classical uh, compositions, mm-hmm. absolutely. Which was funny because my, uh, so I was not allowed to listen to regular pop music growing up. My mother mm-hmm. was very, very evangelical, right? And so uh, I was like, I wonder if there's something I can listen to. I want to hear the radio. I wonder if there's something I can listen to that she won't object to, right? <laughs> so I went through the radio because I had one of those really old classic radios, turn dial and everything. I found this beautiful music playing, and I was like, oh, I know this. This is this is either Beethoven or Mozart. I know this. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I was playing it in my room. My mom walks in. She's like, you can't listen to the radio. I said, Mom, it's <laughs> classical. She's like, all right, you can, you, you can listen to that. And so, so from that point forward, I would just keep it on in my room, and I would just listen to classical music day and night. Yeah. <laughs> so there is some science, supposedly, but statistically speaking, that those who listen to classical music have nine point. Nine points higher on their IQ. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Very cool. Yeah. I don't doubt it. Got, got a genius over there, apparently. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> um, so, it is Christmas. And Gumby, 
Santa Claus is bringing you a gift. Mm. All right. You get to play with any artist you ever have wanted to play with. Who is that artist? Who is the one artist above any other artist that you really, really, really want to play with? <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a jazz musician. Okay. Yeah, because I kind of, I wouldn't say I got my fill, but, uh, you know, if there's one person that's always kind of been on my bucket list, it's because he embodied uh, everything spiritually in terms of writing and, uh, you know, always hit me on the soul kind of level and just an important part of my formative Christian years growing up in my faith. That would be Stephen Curtis Chapman. Okay, yeah. It was yeah. always a goal of mine from early on, especially wanting to be a studio musician. And I'm like, man, if I could just play with him one time and walk away with a Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the way he writes. Okay. I love the way he, he he makes music. I love the musicians he has on his albums. I mean... Favorite song from his, of his? Uh, probably Signs of Life from the album Signs of Life back in 1995. I was in high school at the time. Okay. And I remember hearing this album for the first time and it just kicked my ass. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, oh my gosh. And at the time in 95, that album was so different than all the other Christian uh, albums that were out. It was raw, live musicians, and that was just about the time where they were trying to stream away from live musicians and start using like uh, electronic yeah electronic stuff synthetic musicians and beats and all a different thing and we were starting to make that big leap towards that kind of thing and um, this was just so against the grain I felt like I, I still feel to this day that album Signs of Life by Stephen Curtis Chapman is way ahead of its time amazing musicians one of my favorite drummers on there Craig Beecham and I'm I'm pretty sure he got a Grammy for that album, but That's it's awesome. it's still one of my favorite albums by his. Okay. And so from that point, I'm like, man, I, I'd love to say, man, I could cut a track with him and do that. So okay, yep, That's awesome. Yeah, and he too has his sons that play with him. His son is a drummer, and so that's really cool. Yeah. Great artist, great singer, an amazing influence, and great it, leader of the faith, man. So. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, that's the person that popped in my head first. <laughs> okay, okay. I did meet him a couple times too. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah, so I used to work at a, a Christian bookstore, family Christian stores. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. Yep. They're kind of defunct now. They've been Your out of business. Yeah. So this was bigger down south in the Bible Belt when I lived in South Carolina. I worked at family Christian stores and, you know, we sold books, Christian music, all kind of, you know trinkets and gadgets and oh yeah that. i grew up in the 80s and 90s yeah, cds yeah. and dvds yeah exactly cassette safes <laughs> well you know we had the hey, I, man, cassette safes were on their way out when i was born thank you okay yeah well i mean yeah even around that time they were for me too they were starting to get phased out and you know oh we got some and cassette tape but you know for the diehards but uh so I got a lot. I got to meet a lot of the artists that came through the Christian stores because they would always tour through there to kind of, you know, try to raise support for their, for the work. And he was one of the people I was able to meet. Um, who else? Toby Mac. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Before he was the big Toby Mac now. And <laughs> DC Talk and all of that. And uh, who else? Uh, Cindy Morgan. I don't know if that name ever rings a oh, bell. Oh yeah. I remember him. Um, so yeah, I was able to do that. The cool thing about the Christian stores back in the day when it was in the mall, that's where I worked, uh, is that's where I met, that's where I got close, uh, with my wife, Jen. We, she used to work there because her mom was the manager and that's how I got a job. And Jen and I would have to close the store some nights and we would just crank music and clean and <laughs> stock shelves and all of that kind of thing and... But yeah, so cool history there. That is really cool. That is like really, really cool. But now, I mean, everything is online, which, uh, you know, I'm not complaining. Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I do miss, I do miss the days of, you know, bricks and mortar kind of. So I hope everything circles, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think and we'll see a reemergence of that. I think there's going to have to be something because I don't know if you know this, but 
Um, I'm sure not to get political, but <laughs> I'm sure you know that Spotify paid a very pretty penny to bring Joe Rogan over, right? Mm-hmm. Joe Rogan. And he just talks. Okay. Yeah. He, no, he what, doesn't what, talk. He just listens. Well, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> but here's the funny thing. Then you have somebody like, you mentioned Lady Gaga earlier, right? Yeah. And yet, for her poker face, which has been streamed, what, millions of times by now? Mm-hmm. She got less than $200 for it. Wow. Less than $200 on Spotify. And mind you, this is this is somebody who's established in, in, in music. She does phenomenals, but she got less than two hundred dollars for that song. <laughs> so, it, so it's a little uneven still in streaming. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 not the easiest thing to really make money off of that. Yeah, but um, yep. So there there definitely is some room for improvement. Sure. Yeah. Yep. So, career highlight. What is the favorite? performance that you have ever done just off the top of your head what is the time you can look back and say i was i was inspired i felt phenomenal everything flowed is there a favorite performance that you've ever had hmm that's a tough one because that one would definitely be just from a musician uh, standpoint playing where you know, one of the things that I talked about a little earlier about, you know, the creator and having this ability to create intrinsically in all of us uh, really lends itself to the idea of being an uh, uh, improviser with the jazz. You know, if you're a good listener and you have this idea to create, you want to, you, you love the idea of being able to improvise with people who are simpatico. Who, who get that, who you trust, who can who can do that with you and allow you to do that. Um, so I think, oh man, there's so many of those moments, especially within jazz context. But I remember one specifically. Um, it was, he was with Joe Hunter, who's a local pianist uh, at Nighttown. Just, uh, just an, uh, he's a staple here in Cleveland. He's an absolute legend, Joe Hunter. And... Uh, he was actually my uh, teacher at Tri C in the Jazz Studies program, and we're out on a gig, and this was at a private uh, gala, and we had, we had at the, it was for the Children's Museum. That's where we were at, and at first we weren't sure what to expect there because it's a children's museum, but they had a special place set up for us on top of like overlooking the whole party. All, all, in the old children's museum, not the new one. And it was just so cool with all the lights and the way it was set up. And we had a special place that we just sat above everyone. It was me, him. I can't remember the, who the, who the acoustic bass player was at the time. But I, I remember we just had these moments where we were playing, where we were creating. And when we finished a song, it was like, that was something special. Okay. And you know, it's something that you can never recreate in a sense. You know what I mean? I totally get Where it. it totally felt spiritual. Yeah. And it was, yeah, I, I can't even remember what we played. All I can remember was how the feeling felt. And it was just like, at that time, we just all exposed ourselves. It was probably the bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> but the music was swinging, and we all soloed well, and it just, man. And, awesome. you know. But that is what music is about, just that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially with the idea, you know, again, of being able to improvise and do things like that. Because when you're improvising, you're in the moment and you have to have uh, this certain level of trust with the people you're playing with to allow you to be safe. Okay. And in that, in that sense, I mean, like, they have to be at a certain level – where they can be completely responsible for their own time within music time, you know, ta ta ta, <laughs> you know, just they have to be so responsible for their own time. And so when they can do that, it can allow another person to do whatever they want to do and have the ability to create something that's never been created before. And, um, 
I just remember that moment was so cool. Wish I, I wish it was recorded. I think somebody was videoing it. I don't remember, but yeah, that you know, there's but there's been so many moments like that where people allow you to stretch out and just go at it, man. That's awesome. And I turn into like you know, animal from the Muppet Babies or something. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> That's awesome. That's really what that feeling is like. He's just, animal doesn't care. He's like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> Before we get to the next question, a word from our sponsors. Hey, it's Gumby here from Bible Over Brews. Are you looking to get some editing done in your podcast? Maybe you don't have the hours or time it takes to edit your content, but you still need to get it done. Maybe you need a customized track or a song for your podcast or your next project without having to worry about copyright issues. Well, look no further than soulworkmusic.com, where this footwork is done for you. I'll get that editing post-production work done right for you or create you that customized song that fits your project or podcast to help support your life's work. If this sounds like what you need, reach out to me at soulworkmusic.com. Again, at soulworkmusic.com. And remember, there's nothing taboo over brew. We're back. All right. So we're diving into our next brew before I go into our next line of rapid fire questions. This is going to be a Braxis. This one is actually donated to the podcast. Uh, this one comes to us from Mr. Uh, Brian Ciro from Insider Perks. All right. Nice. So this one I've actually been really looking forward to. So it's an imperial stout brewed with ancho chili peppers, what? cacao nibs, vanilla beans, and cinnamon sticks. Cacao. Pouring deep brown with thick head, this beer has a complex body with a delicious lingering roastiness. Abraxas is brewed with unique ingredients intended to challenge and excite the palate. It may be enjoyed right away or allow to age in the bottle. Vertigo tastings are encouraged. It's an ABV of 11.2. Whoa. Now, see, why can't they have commercials that sound like that? <laughs> I would buy that product if commercials sounded like that. Exactly. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. And this yeah. whole wow, there's no it's head on this. Pipe. No, I, you got to hear. You got to hear Aaron do Sean Connery, man. <laughs> oh, thank Ooh. you, sir. Next time I have to quote somebody, I have to do that. Which we'll do the lines of that coming up. Oh, this looks. So this is actually comes from the perennial. Uh, let me see, perennial artisan ales. Wow. You, go, you say when? Because this is definitely a dar- darker one. So. <laughs> uh, when? All right. This one is a deep, 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 deep black. I can't see through it. It might as well be tar. I I cannot see through it. There's no head whatsoever. There's nothing on top. Mm. It's got a very rich smell. Oh, my Lord. The nose on this thing. By rich, I mean 1% smell. Is your buddy rich? <laughs> <laughs> he does pretty well. Yeah. I've got uh, layers of my you know, Lord, different there's... alcohols that I've had in here. Holy my wine, cow. the other beer. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I smell my cherries. Cherry, but... Yeah, I smell cherries. I smell vanilla. <sighs> there is so many fragrance. In the... I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, yeah. it, it's a potpourri. Of different fragrances. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Potpourri is a good word, actually. <laughs> in a positive sense. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many fragrances happening all at the same time. I don't smell any cinnamon, um, but I do definitely smell the vanilla. I, yep. I, there, There's a, definitely a cherry smell on top of it. Mm-hmm. Is this Imperial, you said? That's what it says. Yeah, I can I can smell it. I will say I would never buy the, or I would never pick this off the oh. shelf. Personally, but I'm looking my forward Lord. to trying this. Mm. Sip this. Oh, my Lord. This is. Mm. <gasps> the complexity of that flavor. It's the second return <laughs> in a cup. Oh, wow. The complexity of this is just phenomenal. Can we say cacao? <laughs> right. I really taste the cacao. Oh, the cacao is like right on top, but it's not overpowering. No. It's like it's so well blended with that vanilla. Oh my gosh. It is like this this may be one of the most well balanced ales I've like ever had. I mean, does it's anybody like, else feel like Montezuma or something? Mm. Good lord. I feel like an Aztec. Wow. King. Perennial. It, it does not taste like an eleven point two. Like this is 
That's an 11.2. Yeah. You, you can get in, get in trouble in, with that one. Oh, well, wow. especially because it's so smooth. It is mm-hmm. incredibly smooth. I mean, all these flavors are just jumping right out. I mean, every time I sip it, there's a new flavor that yeah, comes in. Yeah, you're right. It's very complex in wow. such a good way. Whoa, my! I mean, I, I am I am revitalized at this moment. <laughs> this this is this is dangerous, fellas. Oh my lord! I I don't know if I've ever had anything with the complexity of this flavor. I'm really worried about my moderation. <laughs> <laughs> I only mm. have one bottle. There, there's a depth. There's there's like there's a depth to it. There's it's not quite yeah. black licorice. Mm-mm. There's there's uh, but there's that depth to it though. There's almost a oh, on the, on the back on the back end, there's almost a black licorice flavor without hitting that depth of blackness. Yeah. Um, but wow, this is I could sip this all night, and this we is... should sip it all night, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, holy! I, I don't I don't know if I've ever had anything, but I, I I I have sipped quite a bit. This podcast has opened up quite a bit for us, and. The complex the depth only, to this. The only thing close for me in terms of the complexity, in terms of the the palette, would be uh, Masthead's Underverse Imperial Stout. That is a phenomenal <clears throat> one. Uh, it's phenomenal it, it's one. close, but man, it's I, still different. Yeah. I, I think what sets us apart from the Underverse is that vanilla. Yeah, for sure. That vanilla is just, it, it's subtle, Yeah, but it's there. And it, it beautifully accents that cacao. It's amazing they did this without bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is phenomenal. Well, they do age it inside inside barrels. Is it? So, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I didn't catch that part. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's aged in then the Then that makes barrels. sense. So then I'm going to take a puff of my cigar. That explains the, um, my the oak. My Lord. That, yes. I mean, there's yeah. so yeah. much to this. And there's supposed to be a little bit of cinnamon in there, but... It's so well blended that mm-hmm. it doesn't poke out. Mm-hmm. It, it I just, don't taste the cinnamon at all. Right. It, it's so well blended that it just kind of rides, right? Just it just rides through it. This is a beautifully done uh, porter or imperial. Imperial. Yeah. Do we that know? Is, do we have any price range? Is that acceptable to talk I about? Don't know what the price range is. This can't it, be cheap, man. Oh, it can't oh vary it's not. By state, I, though. I, okay. I can tell you without knowing. I I can tell you it is not cheap. No, but uh-uh. this is just phenomenal. Uh, Brian, thank you. This is fantastic. Yep. <clears throat> wow. So I'm new to the channel and and as a first time guest. So you guys try out a new beer, a new <sighs> drink every time. I don't. We think... try to mix it yeah. up to get a really good variety, and and we 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 try to go. Really good craft brews and and good craft bourbons. Actually, the last time we uh, had a, an Ohio bourbon and our guest had a Texas bourbon. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Really, the only time we repeat a beer is if it's a seasonal thing. Like for sometimes we'll you know we might do the same like Great Lakes Christmas Ale or yeah. you guys should do like Twelve a, uh, Dogs a yeah. Fifty States sort of thing. Get one we have state. expanded. We have expanded, and uh, actually, the Alaska brewery has been really good for us. Oh, we, we've Alaska, tried a, a few from state. Alaska, and I think it's the water. But man, mm. Alaska makes some really good beer. Yeah, I don't so. know too much about pairings, but pistachios and these top notch. <laughs> this and, and the man, cigar. The cacao is hitting me hard on this on these last few sips. Oh right. yeah, yeah. No, this 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 uh. What is the name of this? So this is uh, Perennial, and it's Abraxas. Okay, Abraxas. So the brewery is Perennial, and uh, the beer is Abraxas. Yeah, this and the cigar is just like... It's heaven. They were meant to be together. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. heaven. <laughs> I should not stand in the way of that. <laughs> oh, man, there, there's so many... Again, the best way I can describe it is complex flavors. Yeah. No. And every one of them is, is pleasant. There's nothing overpowering. It's this beautiful blend of different flavors that just rides through every taste bud that you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nothing harsh, nothing hoppy. Nope. I mean, nothing bitter. No. No, it's 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 high end for sure. Yeah, this is just phenomenal. Just wow. 
I I don't know what else I can say about this. It's just thank you, Brian. <laughs> yeah, thank you. This is phenomenal. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Supporting the podcast, right? All right. Diving in to our next question. Bring it. For our musician of the night. Bring it. Gumby, what are the qualities, the enduring qualities, and the ongoing talents that make a good musician? Because I know that you happen to be a great musical teacher, Mm -hmm. and I know that you take your time to help people develop their own personal, uh, not just And not just Mm instrumental-wise, but I know that you take your time to help them develop the feeling of what music genres they're gearing towards, Mm -hmm. um, the different instruments they might be better at. Mm -hmm. So, in in your opinion, what makes a good musical artist with talents, and uh, and what inspirations do they need in order to to make it to that next level beyond just that 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 mid learning phase? That's a good question. Really good question. Um, one of the qualities that I think uh, stands out, and I'll, I'll use kind of a, I'll paint with a broad brush here. Um, not just a new person learning a musician or an instrument and all of that, but I'm speaking broadly here. Uh, one of the qualities that I see that makes. <clears throat> A great a great musician uh, is their their sense of timelessness when I see timelessness within a, a musician and an artist I'm like these people are really walking in their gifts and time by timelessness I mean like they they span across age generation uh, uh, political leaning right yeah because there's some of that in play too uh, they span all of that and transcend all of that like a person like the Beatles I mean I, I I rarely run into anybody who don't know Beatles songs or you know yeah. there's a sense of timelessness with them uh, you know a lot of it has to do with the writing and how it's just so relatable and adaptable and singable and all of that but they're timeless you know another artist who I think is like that um, would be you know for me like uh sting okay i don't know how that man keeps reinventing himself man (laughs) but they do you know yeah uh you know stephen curtis chapman i mentioned him earlier i feel like you know he he does that too um so i think that's what sets apart um the majority of the uh, artists and musicians out there from the ones who I just at that next level who would just transcend timelessness. Okay. So that's that's a quality I really pick up on and that I like to, uh, you know, I'm striving for. So I, I want to be, I don't want to just be geared towards my age or people older than me or whatever. You know, I, I really like whatever I'm creating or whatever I'm doing. I want it to speak to everyone. So and hopefully, you know, it can do that. On that yeah. note, are you taking new students? <laughs> are you interested? <laughs> I've been trying to learn guitar and piano for a while. Oh. So, yes. Oh. <laughs> I know great guitar teachers, but I can help you with piano for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a quality I'm looking, uh, definitely looking for. Um, you know, other artists, you know. Like my kids right now, uh, they love older music. And, you know, and it, there could be some bias there because they grew up in a home where I introduced so many different types of music. But, you know, my kids can sing Tony. Tony Bennett is timeless. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know what I absolutely. mean? And I'm not even talking about age. Age has nothing to do with how that man lives his life. Yeah. He's just, he's timeless. Everything about him and from the inside out, man. Yeah. He's just, he's such a giver of life and soul. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, and it comes across in their music, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So that, that's a quality. I can see that. I've introduced my son to, uh, and my kids in general. Oh, Mm -hmm. I've introduced all of them to, uh, to the classic musicals. 
and and also to uh, to some of the modern musicals. So like on any given day, he'll sit there and he'll play thing anything from like Hamilton, obviously. Yeah, it's but great. but then he's also memorized a lot of songs from Music Man. Mm-hmm. Right, from Robert mm-hmm. Preston. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's great, man. Yeah. From a from a, a drumming standpoint, you know, I you know, like if there's drum students that I have and they're into the newer stuff that's out there, which is great. A lot of amazing new drummers out there, but maybe they never heard of a person called like Gene Krupa or Buddy Rich. Those drummers are timeless. Yeah. And they were so far ahead of their time that. Once a new drummer or a student is exposed to that, their jaw drops. Like, I, you know, I don't even know what to do with that. That is such unbelievable playing and during a different time and era and context, you know, within our country and all of that. It, it's just a beautiful thing that, you know, Buddy Rich is, is living forever and he passed in like 87. Okay. But the man is living forever. So that's what I mean by timelessness, man. Their music just transcends, you know. And the writing of Bob Dylan, you know. <clears throat> I was just listening to Bob Dylan today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I get it. I mean, he, you know, he has his critics in terms of not everyone likes his voice or his singing. But if you look past some of that, yeah. his writing is unbelievable. Oh my lord, it's it's so reflective across not just American culture, but but you can hear echoes of how he grew up. Uh, mm-hmm. His faith, um, the pra- places where people fall short, and the places where they excel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And you know, I mean, I think the greatest probably writers duet are probably have to be Lennon and McCartney. Yeah, those dudes are timeless. They will never die. Yeah, absolutely. They will never die. Yeah. Um, another another artist that you know, really, I was never a fan of growing up. Um, but you know, my son Gio really turned me on to is a big influence. Uh, that's a huge influence for anyone in pop is Michael Jackson. Oh yeah, he will never die. No, no. Some people don't think he did, but that's a whole other subject. <laughs> 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 I digress from that. Yeah, I'm not going down that rabbit trail. But you <laughs> he's, know, he's over there on the island with Elvis. <laughs> right, him, him, Tupac, Elvis, and every campfire with Bigfoot. Right. <laughs> But, you know, his music is so timeless and it reaches so many people. Yeah, so many levels to it. So many. Yeah. And, you know, the, he was he was just so connected to his soul. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really appreciate that kind of, that kind of, um, really just that detail that artists have connected to themselves. I appreciate that. You know, from from a jazz point of view, I think Herbie Hancock is right there. Okay. You know, the man is just an amazing talent. Uh, but his soul is so much more amazing because that's what you feel the most when he plays. So I, it's a beautiful thing. That's awesome. So you, as, a, as an instructor, I'm sure that, that you've had to deal with this. How would you also teach this? Because when you step out, there must be times when you have performance anxiety, right? So, yeah, for sure. So when you're like, you know... You ha- you want to give the best, most flawless performance that you can. Yeah. So there's there's got to be a part of you that it has this deep anxiety. Yeah. How do you deal with that, and how do you teach people to deal with that? <clears throat> yeah, anxiety is a funny thing. You know, it's something that I think uh, musicians are. Uh, you know, it's kind of our maybe our Achilles heel because you know music is such a subjective thing. You know. Um, you're putting yourself out there you're risking something so personal to you and you're putting it out there and you have to risk rejection you have to understand that not everyone's going to like it not everyone's going to want to dig it not everyone wants to buy it but then you'll have those who do and so you have to constantly have some some level of thick skin to continually be putting yourself out there Okay. and so that's where going back to earlier being intrinsically motivated really helps transcend that feeling of anxiety it's like it, i know there there's going to be people who don't like it or who may judge it or whatever but i'm still going to put it out there and, and still put myself out there and do it regardless of because i love to do it so that's where i would i would coach someone to really say like if you know this is what you want to do and you can't help but do it 
that will help you get past the anxiety. Uh, you, you know, and, and I think certain life experiences play into that. It's a lot of other factors. Could be, you know, how you're living, what condition. I mean, you know, you always hear the, the term uh, homeless musicians or living out of their car type musicians. That, that's for real for a lot of people. I know, I know some great jazz pianists around here who were homeless. Amazing musicians. And finally climbed their way out of a certain stereotype, especially within the jazz context, but this applies to all, that you only have to be this in order to be successful, to not fall into that trap. Well, you know, I know I won't mention his name at a for privacy's sake, but I've known a great jazz pianist who who's a podiatrist, hmm. but he went to Berkeley for music. Hmm. An amazing pianist. He was homeless, living out of his car because of expectations of not wanting to uh, disappoint his parents. Okay. And then, but once those things get relieved, and you you know you start to realize, man. It doesn't have to just be one way or the other. Like I can, I can work a quote unquote regular job, right? That's how musicians would look at it. Oh, I can do that with our chip on our shoulder, right? <laughs> you know, until we, we've been humbled in a certain sense and still do the thing that you love and, and be purposed in that there's, there's great uh, freedom in that. And so that alone, having some kind of financial, Stability can help reduce a lot of those anxiety moments or I think, you know, especially if you know music's always going to be a part of your life. Okay. So, yeah, yeah just uh, letting go of some of those expectations of what others have of you and putting it out there. One of the most anxious moments I remember having, though, was in school studying. Uh, and I remember I had to read, I had to perform in front of the faculty, not students, it was just all the faculty of all these amazing teachers and professors and people who were just, you know, you hung off their every word, right? You wanted all their approval and, you know, and I remember thinking, oh, Lord, this is this is an anxious moment. I'm in front of them. I have to read this music and they're critiquing every part of me. Yeah. And I bombed the first time. Terribly. I mean, uh, one piece of music, uh, you know, it was a few pages that I, I had to read. I knew it inside out. I literally could write it out, the whole thing from memory right now. <laughs> In your sleep. In my sleep <laughs> with my left hand, and I'm righty. <laughs> but yet when it came to time to perform it in front of them, I felt like a little three-year-old on the drums. And uh, her name is Jackie Warren. I remember her. She's an amazing pianist, was around local. I don't know if she is anymore. You know, they stopped me. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. They're like, Gumby, take it easy. They're like, you are so tense right now and so stressed and anxious. We can cut it with a knife. They're like, man, we're, we're here for you. You got to remember who you're playing for. Yeah, we're, we're here for you. And I remember the best advice I got in that moment um, was, was through uh, my theory teacher. He said, you know, Gumby... He's like, we're all musicians here. And he's like, we know that you can play. We know what you're capable of. And this is the best advice he ever gave me. He's like, we're waiting for you to lead us. I was just blown away by that. Like, wow, they, you know, they're waiting for me to be a leader. Yeah. And I think that's an anxious, an anxious part in most of us that some people are afraid to lead and be a lead, whether it's in, you know, in a band or in life or at work or wherever, you know, even within families, you know, we have families. Yeah. It, it's a scary thing to lead and be that person responsible to do that. So that applies to music too. And he hit it right on the nail. Once they, you know, they burst that bubble, you know, the next time I went around to it, man, I just, it was like the best, best ever performance ever. And, you know, I got like a standing ovation kind of thing. And <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so so that anxious part really, I think, has a lot to do with uh, not being afraid to lead and not being afraid to fail. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. 
No, that's that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Isn't that great advice, though? That's great advice. Man, can you yeah. imagine that from your peers just saying, man, we are waiting for you to lead us. <laughs> you are Spartacus. Yeah. Lead yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned family, because that, 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 uh -huh. that does echo. That does echo. It was, uh, sure. it was not too long ago, actually. I was out shopping. Um, I brought my son with me to go to, to the store, and, uh, and, uh, and he turns to me. He said, Dad... It dawned on me that the average person only lives to be around 80 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what I'd do without you. And he reached over and gave me this big hug, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so that, that really, that, that, that carried through quite a bit because, as you know, I'm not really close to, to my parents, really. So, especially yeah. my mother. But, um, and so, if you can impart something to your children and your students, yeah, you know that, uh, that that's gold, right? That's that's absolutely gold. Absolutely. I mean, what what an epiphany your son had. It's it's very. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's so true. That's that's deep, man. Yeah. yeah. And it's important thing to really consider and think about because you know once you have that, especially at his age, it's so young to really even be thinking like that. Life becomes such a different thing. It becomes such a gift that's. Uh, sacred again you know it, it, it's so cliche to say oh life is a gift but to really think about that from moment to moment like what your son is doing is like yeah you couldn't ask for more of a god moment than that man because life becomes so sacred at that point yeah it's so true that's why you know i i, I want my kids to really feel that way and walk in whatever wherever god leads them i just want to support them and yeah whether it's music or whatever it, it doesn't matter but just live it yeah. Live it. I, yeah. I tried to add a little bit of levity to it. So I said, oh, well, kid, we believe that the power of the resurrection echoes forward. So if you strike me down, I will come back harder than you can ever believe. You know, yeah. Kind of uh, paraphrasing uh, my Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> Which his series will be coming out soon, hopefully. Right. I'm looking forward to that. Right. <laughs> it's... I have yet to see the book. Uh, what is it? The book of oh book oh book of Boba Fett. Yes, we've book been of watching. Boba that's Fett. phenomenal. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I, I'm, I'm. But we're, yes, no that's spoilers. an upcoming episode of Bible Over Brews Reviews. So we're not going to do that right now. Yeah, because that, that's coming. That episode is coming. Yeah, um, I haven't seen it either. I've been. I oh, keep asking my sons. I'm they, like, come on, let's watch it. Oh, we're going to because and that like, is uh, definitely. I'm trying to episode. finish up Mandalorian. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was great. Yeah. That was also great. Yeah. That was also so no great. spoilers. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Um, speaking of mentors, <clears throat> yeah. Do you have a favorite mentor, and why are they fa your favorite mentor? How did they inspire you to push forward? Who was forward? your sensei? Mm. Oh. Musically, or just in general, or well, well, we're leaning musically. But if there is somebody else in your life that was a mentor to you that helped you push you forward, then that's perfectly acceptable. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Short answer, yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh gosh, I don't know how to even answer that musically. Um, <laughs> I think because I, maybe it's because of the stage that I'm at now in my life, and where I'm kind of looking at life is, you know, from an uh, from the whole living, every part, not just, I'm not trying to uh, compartmentalize certain things, you know, like this is just my music life, this is just my, this is just my marriage, this is just my parenting dad life, you know, or work life or whatever. So, <clears throat> I do have a spiritual mentor that I look up to a lot. I, I'm not at liberty to say his name at the moment, but it, it does help me musically. And I will say that because it once you find who that mentor is in your life, and I'm I'm speaking to everyone here, not just musicians, but man, a a true mentor and you know what I call almost like a spiritual unpacker. They have ways of unlocking things inside of you. You start finding yourself more creative than you've ever been. Um. 
I, I, I just can't mention his name without his permission, and I. That's fine. I'd love that's, to have him that's on. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. But um. Yeah, and so, it had it has it, you know. I I felt like after you know meeting with him for so long. I used to be down on myself because I used to say, you know, I can create music, I can, you know, I can compose, I can, you know, chart out songs, blah, 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 blah. But I have no ability to write lyrics, I felt. And for the longest part of me, you know, I felt like that was always kind of my Achilles heel. I'm like, man, well, you know, I feel like I can create this great music, emotional music and all of that. But why can't I write lyrics that I feel that are meaningful? you know, or, mm. or good or that relate. And, and it might be my own insecurities at play there. Uh, but once, you know, I started unpacking a lot of things spiritually on a, on a deeper level, I felt like that. All right. You know, I can, I can start, I can start writing lyrics and, and not feel like it's, you know, I don't know, cheese ball shit. <laughs> and, uh, that are really, speaking about where I'm at or where I think life is at and you know all, all these different things so I've always admired people who could do that and uh, this mentor in my life I felt like really was able to help me unpack what was kind of blocked I think in me so I think we, we have to you know whether you're a musician or not you have to find whatever those blocks are in your life Okay. Spiritually, talk about it, face it, own it, and man, do you see things open up the way you've never seen before? It's like really beginning to see the unseen realm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 understanding that man, we don't just live in the physical. You you're kind of like in this dualistic mindset. That's where I feel like some of the greatest writers just lived. People like Miles Davis. He did, I, I, I'm I was convinced. This week. I am convinced that the man didn't didn't just see what you and I see. Yeah. You know, or Santana, or, or Coltrane, or a lot of these great writers like James Taylor, or you know, or even Sting. You know, I think I'm convinced that these people have a deeper sense of what it means to be spiritual because it transcends religion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm not just talking about organized religion. I don't. It, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the the essence of what makes us human. Your and, truth. Yeah, and being able to connect with other people who don't, uh, you know, who might be Muslim, mm-hmm. or who might be an Orthodox Jew, or whatever, whatever the you know Buddhist or whatever. They Music just, is its own language. Exactly, it is a language that is universal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the creator's language. The language of the soul. Yeah. And, and no matter what what you compose your music as, mm-hmm. and, and as you've shown, you're, you don't know how to put your words to your music. Your music is your truth. Yeah. So no matter what, if you are Muslim, if you're Hindu, if you're Catholic, if you're Presbyterian, mm-hmm. that music that you play, that, you're, that you compose, yep. that feeling that you get when you listen to that song... Yeah. It doesn't matter what language, what words are f- are coming out that you think, that you feel. It is that song, that music, that gives you that feeling, that inspiration, that longing that you need. Yeah. That connects us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That should, you know, and we should have no reason to be connected. Mm-hmm. You live in this side of the world, you do this, this, and that. I live on this side of the world, I do this, this, and that. But yet we're still connected. People talk about how um, sign language should be the universal language, hmm. other than you know English, which is what most people around the globe speak. True, we know Adam and Eve spoke English, but yeah, I do. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but right now, currently, right. most people speak English. But yeah. the most common tongue, silently, would be sign language. Hmm. But the most universal, the most understood language is music at 100 percent. yeah 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 i that's, agree that's yeah. phenomenal all right we've we've dived to different levels of of uh not just music but the depths of your soul in that yeah final question yeah do you have other favorite hobbies that you enjoy 
And if, if you do, what are they? Yeah, well, I do love working with my hands. I do love doing construction stuff. Uh, like I remodeled my bathroom. Game nights with tacos. <laughs> yeah, games, you know, family game nights with, you know, with really good friends. Um, uh, in terms of not playing music, other things surrounding music would be like uh, recording, engineering, mixing, that kind of thing. I enjoy doing it for other people. Which Obviously, is the Bible of Bruce. Podcast editing, or right? <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> she said paper things. She didn't uh, mention. You know, I at this point in my life, you know, I appreciate the finer things of life. So, uh, you know, just being around rich friends that you love. Um, other hobbies, you know, I hmm, other than music. <laughs> Is there anything else? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, whew. you know, uh, quality things. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, I love good quality beer, a good quality cigar. So life. Uh, so life is your hobby. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate uh, deeper talks. Do you um, feel like you're consumed more by the necessities of the current socioeconomic sort of like how culture is today that you can't really go into what you're what you want to have your hobbies as? It, it, is is music your only escape to the reality that you wish to have, or do you feel like mm. there's other things that help you be the person that you want to be? Yeah, no, there are certainly other things for sure. Um, you know, I I definitely enjoy uh, exercise. I mean, I'm really uh, I enjoy working out with my son. We I think last week I don't know. We, we got to the gym, I don't know how many times. So I, I definitely enjoy working out, running. I love running. Awesome hobbies. Yeah. Good hobbies. I, went, I kind of went around in, the, in a little different circle for them. <laughs> it seemed to work out for them. Seemed to unpack it there for me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> all, those, all those schmucks who enjoy working out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I got a little you know, jiggle jiggle for workout, right? I do enjoy sports. I mean, I love boxing, you know. So I love enjoying... Uh, Enjoy my combat sports. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, if you live in Are Cleveland... Are you taking new students? <laughs> Always. Good to know. Yeah. I'll talk to you after the show. Oh, we could do spend a whole episode on that. <laughs> could spend a whole episode on that. Which I think we are planning somewhat i think we are yeah mm -hmm. because i yeah we'll, we'll deal with that later i'll do i'll do my <laughs> shameless plugs in a later episode but yeah we can do with yeah. that singing um, i think i mentioned that but that's in music so well gumby yeah. this has been a pleasure where can we find you if we want to listen to you get instructed by you where is a place online or anywhere else that we can get a hold of you yep right now at info uh Info at soworkmusic.com. That that website is under construction right now, so it's still accessible, but it's the old one. It's being uh, updated right now uh, through the help of my amazing daughter who, uh, you know, is doing media and all of that. Um, so she's doing a great job, and I'm really happy with how it's turning out. Awesome. So it Another is being... a child that he inspires. <laughs> right. <laughs> Among many children, I got to... You know, a small quiver, right? right. I, got a, <laughs> I got a village, but um, yeah. So it's it's being updated. Uh, info at soworkmusic.com right now, and they can reach out, or they can reach out to the podcast or to you and get a hold of me. Excellent. That's soul s o u l. Mm -hmm. So soworkmusic.com. Yep. All right. That's awesome. Yeah. And, Gub uh, Gubby, thank you so much. You uh, you are the heart and soul of this podcast. So uh, nope, not I know, at all, not I, at all, dude. I, I know I appreciate you. I know that you are awesome, and uh, only one piece. <laughs> and I am uh, eternally glad that you are in this podcast with with us to share everything that we can. Oh, do. likewise, man. amen. Yeah, yeah, likewise, man. It's my pleasure. It's uh, you know, you know what that you know. That is the other thing. I love doing this talking in this podcast. I mean, I don't even know how I missed that other than being here in the moment. It just kind of <laughs> made me overlook that. But, man, this has been such a big part of our lives, man. Yeah, hey, man. Talking about it and just getting, man, having the ability to have a safe place to talk is a big hobby of mine outside of music. And it's yeah. so important because 
uh, especially coming out of 2020 or uh, the last two years out of COVID and all of that, it seems like a safe place is a pretty rare thing anymore. We've built, Sam, this podcast to be a safe place for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're, we're going to continue that, man. So Whether you agree with uh, an opinion or not, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your yeah. opinion is valid. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's definitely you, Chop. So. And there's nothing taboo over brew. Ever. <laughs> or, other than you, Dylan. Your, valid, your opinion is not valid. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Godspeed, Gubby. Any last words, Sam? No, I'm good. Just God bless. Keep on doing what you're doing, and I'm uh, looking forward to coming back for a very political discussion, too. Oh, looking that, forward to my, that. Looking forward to that. Politics and philosophy are my favorite topics, Ooh. and That'll be... I wrote like three pages of philosophy about music, and I was not expecting this type of podcast today, so this worked out po- wonderfully. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. You'll come back to our other podcast, Bible Over Bruce. All right. Mm-hmm. Godspeed, everybody, and good night. Peace out.